Coming up. In the daytime, the sun shines through the atmosphere, warming Earth's surface. You've heard of the greenhouse effect. Some of that heat is trapped by the gases in the atmosphere. We take a closer look at one of its biggest culprits. A gas planet can't live without, but one it's pretty hard to live with too. CO2 has a very, very long lifetime in the atmosphere, so it stays there for thousands of years. Turkish scientists spot an increasingly rare species on Antarctica's Horseshoe Island, a bird that can withstand temperatures as low as minus 60 degrees Celsius. It's a nice indicator that uh, emperor penguins returning there. And losing their cool over our heating planet, a man charges at climate crusaders who are blocking a busy bypass in Berlin. This is just two degrees. The climate protectors vowed to ramp up their activism at the start of the year, and that's exactly what we've been seeing. And on a weekly basis, too. Well, this guy with his dog wasn't a protester. He lunged at people, as you can see, who were trying to bring traffic to a halt in Berlin. The demonstrators are from the group Last Generation. Police said protests took place over 30 different locations with many people gluing themselves to the street to sound the alarm global warming. And you ever wonder how protesters get unstuck after using strong adhesives? The police had to use drills and a crowbar to free that guy in Berlin. Other activists were also removed one by one. The group Last Generation wants Germany to stop using all fossil fuels by the year 2030. The climate crisis warnings are coming fast, but they didn't just begin. For decades, scientists have been warning about the impacts of global warming. But why? What is it about greenhouse gases that are so devastating? Sharon takes a look at a gas that accounts for the highest percentage of human-related emissions. Breathing is a natural process. We cannot see or smell oxygen and carbon dioxide, but they are everywhere, in the air and sea. But from as far back as the 18th century, we've progressively increased CO2 levels in our atmosphere. By extracting coal, oil and gas from the earth, we've powered our cars, planes and ships. But what is carbon dioxide and why is it such an issue? You may have heard of the greenhouse effect. Here's an example of how it works. We start with two clear uh, soda bottles and partially filled with water. I filled them about halfway with water. Then you want to have a thermometer for each. Uh, ideally, you could use just a plain glass thermometer, fit it, sit in there, or I like using these digital uh, Vernier GoTemp, uh, uh, which I can just monitor on the computer, and that's what I'm going to do. So uh, and then you need a lamp, a heating source, and the idea is that the, one of them, we're just going to put the stopper on it, and we'll stick the temperature in here, the probe in there, and now it will record the temperature of the, of the gas in there. So what we're going to use is these Alka-Seltzer tab tablets. Um, I bought the cheap ones from Walmart, but they should work fine. And so I'm going to stick them in there, and you know they will effervesce and they will. Okay, hopefully you can see that. Now I'm going to put put the stopper on here, and I am going to stick my temperature probe. Okay, tight. And now I'm going to turn the lamp on. And 
I am going to observe the temperature for an hour. It's been almost an hour. This uh, lab, this demonstration is about over. You didn't need to wait an hour, but uh, my temperature change for the approximately 40 centimeters that I had from this light bulb to these bottles was nine degrees Celsius, warmer in the, in the bottle. With carbon dioxide consists of one carbon atom and two of oxygen. The chemical compound itself isn't bad. Plants, after all, breathe in CO2, much like we do oxygen. Without carbon dioxide, plants could not release the O2 humans and animals need to survive. But across the world, forests, jungles, and coral reefs are and have been decimated at an alarming rate. It's upset the balance of the elements. There's now much less oxygen and a lot more carbon dioxide. And there is a direct connection with the levels of CO2 and the temperature of our planet. How does it work? Well, the sun's rays enter the Earth, which sends some of that energy back into space. But carbon dioxide gets in the way, trapping much of that solar heat. Without CO2, we'd freeze, and life on Earth would be very different, if there were any life at all. But too much carbon dioxide, we've already been seeing the results. Hotter summits and more powerful storms. Uh, by the end of last year, and, and we have again broken records in main greenhouse gas concentrations, uh, carbon dioxide, methane, and nitrous uh, oxide. And, uh, and last uh, 10 years, they have been warmest on, on, on record. And so far, we have reached 1.15 uh, degrees uh, warming. And with gases like CO2 on the rise, it's becoming increasingly difficult for the planet to sustain life. Sharon, Ogunle, just two degrees. Oh, and here to talk to us about the significance of CO2 and its impact on climate change is Oksan Tarasona. She is the head of the Atmospheric Environment Research Division, Science and Innovations Department at the World Meteorological Organization. Hi, Oksan, it's good seeing you. Uh, so we just heard there in Sharon's mm -hmm. package how this carbon dioxide gets trapped into the atmosphere, the upper atmosphere. Why does it stay there so long? I mean, why doesn't more just escape into space? This is, this is a part of the uh, our atmosphere. There's uh, a lot of uh, carbon dioxide, which is actually cycling in the atmosphere. And without, we heard that without carbon dioxide, the life on the planet would be impossible. And this is kind of a natural environment. Oh, we have for plants which are respirating and producing a lot of CO2 in the atmosphere, then the plants are doing the photosynthetic activity, so they pull CO2 from the atmosphere. What happens is that we as humans, when we started um, burning the fossil fuel, we produce additional CO2 which actually upsets the natural balance of the gases and um, part of the uh, CO2 which we emit due to our activities is taken up by the biosphere. For example, about 25% is taken by the plants and about 25% is taken by the ocean. And the remaining emissions stay in the atmosphere. And CO2 has a very, very long lifetime in the atmosphere. So it stays there for thousands of years. So it's not just that it's emitted now. The levels which we see of CO2 in the atmosphere now it's an accumulation since we started emitting. So the levels which we have now is accumulation of all CO2, which we emitted since 19, 1750, since pre-industrial revolution. So we deal now with the whole human history when we do the burning of the fossil fuel. Yeah, I'm glad you brought that point up because you keep <laughs> hearing that um, the activity, the CO2 levels we see today uh, because of the activity that we've had decades ago. Um, and of course, that means all the plant life, all the forests, the jungles, the trees are so important. Uh, the, the biosphere is extremely important and the biosphere takes up 25% of emissions which we put in the atmosphere. And it has been taking the CO2 for all the time. So since we started human activities, the uptake of CO2 by the biosphere was increasing, but we 
we change the climate. So the we see that the changes in temperature and precipitation pattern bring us to the fact that some of the forest, for example, the Amazonian forest, they changed their regime. So parts of the forest which used to be the sink of CO2, so they were taking up CO2, the plants are so stressed because of the water availability and because of the heat that the plants are just respirating. So they, they are living species, so they are breathing just like humans are doing, right. but because of the stress they just do not take up CO2. So um, that can be pretty uh, significant problem in the future if all the plants are under the stress their capacity to take up CO2 will change. And of course, that's why it's so important we protect more of the ocean. Oksana, it was great chatting with you. Thank you. Well, don't mow your lawn. That's what conservationists are telling people and garden owners. In order to restore local habitats for the sake of wildflowers, other plants and fungi, including rare and endangered species. Sarah has more on this annual campaign. People with lawns and gardens often spend a lot of time clipping and grooming to keep them in shape. But the UK charity Plant Life says putting down the shears and keeping the mower stowed is better for the environment. The first and biggest thing that I noticed was the massive boost to the biodiversity in the garden. It absolutely blew me away. That's why Plant Life is encouraging people to join in on another No Mow May, an initiative which has become popular across the UK and the US. A study in Appleton, Wisconsin, found homes that didn't mow in May had three times more bee species and five times more bees compared to yards that were mowed. The group, which preserves and restores plant-based habitat, says the UK has lost nearly 97 percent of its flower-rich meadows since the 1970s. Not mowing, they say, allows long grasses and wildflowers to grow which in turn cleans the air, traps carbon in the ground, and nurtures beneficial insects. A consistently mowed lawn cuts down on the native plant biodiversity that's needed for pollinators like bees, butterflies, moths, and even fireflies to thrive. Not only that, but the practice burns fuel for the lawn mower and saps water in a time of drought. Plant Life says managing even the smallest patches of grass can benefit pollinators and other species. And with more than 20 million gardens in the UK alone, the more who join in on No Mow May there and abroad, the more benefits for the climate too. Sarah Balter, just two degrees. Meanwhile, across in Italy, the water level of the country's longest river, the Po, is already as low as it was in summer of 2022. And that's sparking fears of dry months ahead. Dominic has more. Italy's River Po has seen better days. The 652-kilometer river runs from the northwestern city of Turin to Venice on the eastern coast. It passes through regions which are densely populated highly industrialized and where most of the country's food comes from. The water also powers turbines and attracts millions of tourists every year. But those who rely on it are now frustrated with little options left. Allora, this is the part that we have not been able to excavate due to the lack of the water and so, as you can see, it remains only the terrain and usually the water here is a meter or more, at least a meter, a meter or a meter more. From this part, where I am currently working, we have managed to excavate this summer in the water because the water was allowed with the drag, we have excavated the water, we have excavated the water, we have removed the water, we have removed the water, we have removed the water, il, il, il terreno sotto e abbiamo un metro, un metro, un metro e cinquanta il canale per uscire con le barche, quindi attualmente possiamo ancora uscire con le barche. At the beginning of April, water levels hit a record 30-year low after an unusually dry and warm winter in the surrounding Alps. Ma la situazione è, è di grande criticità e i livelli che vengono misurati oggi sono livelli in alcuni casi che eh, nel 2022 si trovavano nel mese di giugno, in, cioè in una situazione 
dove già la stagione in rigo era nel pieno della sua attività. The alpine lakes essential for the survival of Italy's rivers during the summer on average store about 100 million liters of water, but the current level is barely half of that. Natural and artificial lakes in the once heavily snow-covered peaks are already 30% below their seasonal average levels. Sì, attualmente la provincia autonoma di Bolzano, come peraltro tutte le province e le regioni dell'arco alpino, stanno vivendo una situazione drammatica per quanto riguarda le precipitazioni. Infatti negli ultimi 18 mesi siamo stati abbastanza, abbiamo avuto abbastanza poche precipitazioni in questo e questo adesso si comincia a denotare. Quest'anno la copertura nevosa è circa il 75% al di sotto della media pluriennale in un periodo lungo e pertanto questo soprattutto in prospettiva futura, soprattutto adesso che arrivano le, arriva la stagione calda, è un problema perché manca il deflusso della neve che si scioglie. Italy is bracing for a second consecutive year of severe drought. Last month, Prime Minister Giorgia Meloni set up a control room to monitor water capacity across the country. Some regional governments have started water rationing, but with poor levels so low, Italians will continue feeling the effects, at the very least, for months to come. Dominic Brian Omondi, just two degrees. We've talked a lot about the polar regions in the past. Well, they're a good indicator of just how fast our planet is warming. But the poles don't just have ice and snow. There is an entire ecosystem there without which species like polar bears and whales would cease to exist. And Natasha takes a look at the scientists investigating this unique circle of life and an animal too small to see with the naked eye, but whose importance cannot be overstated. Meteorological data from Antarctica's Horseshoe Island suggests temperatures in the region have increased by one degree in the last year. That's why Turkish scientists have been doing atmospheric research in and around the region to determine the rate of ice decline and signs of pollution. The team worked on lakes on the island to examine the levels and distribution of human-induced pollutants. While collecting water samples, they discovered two different species of zooplankton fossils dating back tens of thousands of years. Horseshoe Island has four lakes. Both Turkey and the UK are working to have them all listed as protected areas from 2024. If successful, they'll be added to the only 72 areas in Antarctica under special protection. Researchers say they've observed sea ice levels in 2023 are very low compared to previous years. The ice is pivotal to the region's food chain. Krill, small shrimp-like crustaceans, use the shelf as shelter and breeding grounds. And with their massive numbers, krill serve as food for whales, seals, and penguins. When the ice melts, this balance of nature is disrupted. Adding to their discoveries, the Turkish team sighted a baby emperor penguin on the island for the first time this year. The team says they've not seen the emperors since expeditions began in Antarctica in 2017. It's not what the team traveled there to find, but an encouraging sign nonetheless. Natasha Hussein, just two degrees. And here to speak to us about Turkey's Antarctic expedition is assistant professor at Istanbul Technical University, Burak Karacik. He joins us from Istanbul. Hi, professor. It's great seeing you. I mean, I'm always so impressed to learn of people who go to such cold regions for research. Um, firstly, um, did you find that levels of human-induced pollution uh, are increasing there? Uh, actually, yes. Uh, we saw human effects on the islands. Uh, it, it is visible uh, since the touristic, uh, also touristic activities in, increase in the Antarctica. We saw several uh, small debris of microplastics there uh, and also analyzing the sediments and water samples for the persistent organic pollutants there, uh, which shows uh, the human activities are visible there uh, during the last year periods. Are these plastics that you found coming from countries near Antarctica, coming from people who live on Antarctica, how are they getting there? 
Uh, microplastic can travel in several different ways, uh, especially with ocean currents. Even with the air, uh, small particles can travel long distance. Uh, the position is the main factor. You can find it on the ice surface because they are nanoparticles, very small plastics. Uh, so you can find it on lakes, ice, and the sea very easily. Uh, you can also identify the source, uh, which we saw the macroplastic parts, uh, mainly from the ships. We saw some parts of like buoy parts or small, uh, tiny ropes, which use for the nets uh, or hunting. Uh, we find those macroplastics, which is mainly visible there. Uh, and those sources are mainly the ship traffic around the Antarctic area. And I know you and your team were very careful not to leave any uh, pollution of your own. Uh, meanwhile, I understand that you found uh, some tens of thousands years old zooplankton in Antarctica. What can they tell us about the Earth's past atmosphere? Uh, those zooplanktons are tiny organisms. Uh, you can check their shells or their uh, structures uh, to tell us what's the carbon dioxide level in the atmosphere, what is the pH on the ocean, what is the current in there. They are a nice uh, indicator for those environments in the past em environments where they live that time period. So by analyzing those things, we can judge the weathers and environmental conditions, the climates during that time period from those tiny zooplanktons. I understand you also found an emperor penguin chick, um, which I believe lived on Horseshoe Island specifically in large numbers. Why did their numbers decrease? And what does it mean that you've now found a chick there? Uh, it's a nice indicator that uh, emperor penguins returning there. There used to be, on the old records, there used to be some uh, emperor penguin colonies near the islands, near the Austria islands. Uh, recently, they are returning. We saw the ice retreating. The ice shelf is retreating on the islands, which creates a more environment, actually, for those animals which can stand on the rocks and other surface. Uh, recent years, uh, we saw the increase of those an animal populations there. Uh, but of course, our study is mainly monitoring. That's why we are there and we monitor the environment and those animals around the islands. But we, of course, need more data to explain uh, how it's going on. Uh, that's why our research is important there, that we monitor every year uh, the changes on the environment. Which space is there? How is it going for the emperor penguins or other penguin colonies? For example, this year, uh, on the elderly penguin population are degrees mm. compared to the last years. Got it. Professor, it was great chatting with you. Really grateful for your time. We hope one day you will allow our team to come and film you and one of your expeditions in Antarctica. Thanks again. <laughs> All right, we'll take a look at this before we leave you. A climate activist set up an interesting display in Portugal. All right, it may look like art at first, but actually it's just a reminder of an ugly and overlooked form of pollution. I hope to see you next time. Bye. in the middle of Lisbon's Praça do Comércio. Andres Noe serves on top a sea of 650,000 cigarette butts. It may seem like a strange form of entertainment for cash, but this German climate activist is actually making a statement about a harmful habit. The main problem with the butts, it's not biodegradable. So basically it contains a form of plastic and even worse, a lot, a lot of toxins and heavy metals, chemicals. It took Andreas a week to collect the equivalent of nearly 33,000 boxes of cigarettes. 
that's enough waste to fill 40 plastic buckets. He called the project a beautiful example of how someone can take action against pollution. With any rain, all those toxins getting flushed out of the cigarette butt and getting straight on the street from the sinks into uh, here right now, we are next to Teja River, uh, goes all straight into the ocean. He's right about that. Tobacco products are the most littered item on the planet, according to the World Health Organization. They contain over 7,000 toxic chemicals, which leach into our environment when discarded. I need this mask because I feel the smell and I feel if I'm too long in here, I'm getting dizzy and I'm getting headache. Roughly 4.5 trillion cigarette filters pollute our oceans, rivers, city sidewalks and soil every year. The tobacco industry also costs the world 600 million trees, 22 billion tons of water, and more than 8 million human lives annually.